Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this LeanPub Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Ian Mile. Ian has more than 20 years' experience in IT and has worked on software for some of the world's most demanding systems, and he is currently uh, employed in Canary Wharf in London uh, for a big uh, financial services company. Ian is the co-author of Docker in Practice, which was published with Manning, and he's now also the author of a new LeanPub book slash course, uh, Learn Bash the Hard Way, Master Bash Using the Only Method That Works. You can follow Ian on Twitter at Ian Mile, that's E, uh, that's I-A-N-M-I-E-L-L, and you can read his blog at swishandsooks.com. In this interview, we're going to talk about Ian's background and career, professional interests, uh, his his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience writing and as an author. Uh, so thank you, Ian, for being on the Lean Pub podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, I usually like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story, um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you got interested in IT. Uh, oh, uh, okay. So I guess, uh, I grew, oh, I grew up in London, first of all. Um, and I first got interested in IT, I guess, when I was around the age of eight or nine, when I came home one day and my dad had a, a spectrum, a Sinclair spectrum. Um, I don't know if they had those in the States. Uh, I think they were called Tandy something or other. We had Tandys in uh, Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it had the rubber keys and, and the, the multiple things on each key that multi-purpose, uh, keyboard. Um, and I remember, yeah, I, I was pretty excited about that. Um, actually I looked back recently and found that, that the cost of that computer then would have been the equivalent of quite, you know, a reasonably expensive secondhand car now. So it was quite an investment my dad made in uh, in my future, and it wasn't it wasn't a birthday or anything. Anyway, so uh, I got that, and I remember I used to write a lot of computer games, adventure games, and so on. Um, and then uh, I hit adolescence and uh, got into the arts, um, and I studied uh, history at university. Um, wanted to be a writer or a poet or something or an essayist journalist that kind of thing that was the that was the plan um and then <clears throat> through that i i did actually work as a journalist very briefly uh for the times in london the times of london um for a few weeks um and then was kind of turned off the whole thing um didn't didn't really enjoy it so i kind of left university not really knowing what i wanted to do um a lot of my colleagues were going into law or um, management consulting or accountancy or, you know, the, the standard sort of um, post, post-university post careers. Um, and I just kind of drifted around for a couple of years. I uh, spent a year in Vienna teaching English. I, um, I temped for a year. And then uh, it was during my year abroad that someone said, oh, you seem to like these computer things you know uh, and I remembered that I'd, I'd enjoyed computing when I was a kid and and I still like maths and logic and so on and so uh, it seemed a natural step to to just yeah you know, also there was this was the uh the dot-com era you know when when everything the internet was taking off it's about the turn of the century the internet was taking off um and everyone wanted to start a, a dot-com company so uh, I borrowed some money and did a course, a conversion course in computing, um, which was a year-long course at, at the University of London. And I uh, followed that, finished that, got a job, uh, finished a little early, finished my thesis early, started work. And that was, you know, around uh, 15, 17 years ago. Um yeah. So yeah. Thanks for that that story. I mean, we can maybe pause there because there's a few things I'd like to I'd like to ask you about before we before we go on. Um, the the first is that um, uh, what was it about adventure games that you found so interesting? I'm just asking because that was when I first started playing computer games. Other than Atari 2600 games, it was the adventure games that really drew me in. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't particularly into playing them. I liked or kind of. I've always liked simple arcade games, Breakout, and that that kind of thing. Um, I think, I think there was a very good level of support in that time for creating your own adventure games, because I guess it's, it's text-based. 
Um, it doesn't require actually any sort of very sophisticated programming, uh, whereas a lot of the arcade games did because they were much more demanding. And if you're eight or nine, oh, I, I was eight or nine, um, I guess just writing some text to evoke a world was was pretty you know easy stuff, pretty standard stuff for me. Whereas whereas learning machine code was a, uh, I mean this was the days before you could Google anything, so. I, I was curious as to how it worked, but no one around me knew how it worked. No one could show me. There were no books that I could find. Um, it was just a bit of a bit of a mystery to me how all that worked. Um, I remember looking at, at machine code and thinking that looks really interesting, but that's where it ended because there was nowhere for me to go. Um, so yeah, adventure games were were, were easier to do, and, and there were. I remember there was a thing called the general application, general adventure control. I had this acronym GACPAC, G-A-C-P-A-C, and uh, it was this great 20, it was 22 pounds, I still remember the price, really expensive, and you could create your own games with it, and then you could, you know, I was I was talking with friends about starting a company, selling these games, and so on. Um, it was a really exciting kind of, I guess it was, you know, late era punk kind of mentality to it. Um, I really I really enjoyed it, it just seemed like there was nothing stopping you from from just doing this stuff. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that story. It's actually um, a kind of unofficial theme of this podcast because so many of the people um, that I interview uh, are in are in the IT space. Uh, one of the really interesting things to hear about is their first experience with with computers, um, and and it's interesting that uh, how often it is uh, actually a father bringing home a computer mm. um, that that and and someone just the like you know not not for everybody but not everybody ends up you know. Uh, on this podcast, I suppose, but so, for some people, just the the light bulb goes off, um, and it's just an amazing kind of turning point. But it's funny; I was reflecting on this recently because my son is, in fact, you might be able to hear him shouting at his screen. Uh, he's he's playing on his Xbox right now, and he he just got a uh, one of those ear uh, one of those microphone headsets. That's the word headsets. Uh, and he's online with his friends and they're playing games and they're collaborating. And I was thinking, you know, my, my wife's pretty worried about, you know, is there too much screen time and all that stuff? Um, but I'm less worried because I, I think, well, he's doing what I do at work every day. I mean, he's basically coordinating activity with his friends um, while sitting in front of a screen. And that's pretty much what I have to do every day. Um, so it's a pretty good preparation for life as it is now. But I do wonder if I should go and buy him a 3D printer or something, and you know that's going to be the future. But it's pretty hard to second guess the future. Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting contrast too. I mean, there's you know there's with more primitive technology, it, it sort of brings its own type of complexity and creativity. But um, the kinds of I think I, I don't know because I don't have kids myself, but I think what kids are doing on computers these days is in some ways very very different. Um, from what people of our vintage were doing, you know, with like pit, pitfall. Um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely very different. I mean, I remember, you know, this is, this is turning into a bit of a reverie, but uh, I remember sitting with my my best friend at school. We have a cup of cup of tea while we waited for the game for the game to load, and we just chat about, you know, and it was quite reflective. It was quite therapeutic because. There was nothing else going on, and we'd just be staring at the screen, waiting for this thing to happen, and just the two of us talking. It was actually quite a peaceful uh, way to to be with someone. Um, kids, my, obviously, my kids don't have that now. They never have to wait more than ten seconds for anything to load. So I was going to say I, I'm more of a shout at the computer type person than that. I just sat there, always anxiously waiting for things to load, being angry. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I wish I'd taken a lesson from your book um speaking of of i mean i suppose reveries are you so you so you studied you studied history um mm -hmm. what what led you to make that decision and i just want to uh put this in some uh perspective for people listening um ian went to the university of oxford for his undergraduate degree um and at that university um you have to choose a single subject to study um so you know it's not there's no sort of there, there is more or less no kind of general arts kind of idea um, that's implemented there. And there are workarounds that people have, like subjects like 
they'll they'll group a bunch of subjects into one like philosophy politics mm. and economics but if you for example dis- decide to study history like that's what you're doing mm-hmm. um and so what what and that can be a very big and i know from my time there as a graduate student um you know how stressful those first that, mm. that first time those first few moments are there when you have to make that choice and i wanted to ask you what led you to choose history well, I guess to, to extend back further that, that context, um, at, in Britain um, then and now, I think, uh, you have to specialize at 16. Um, so you pick three subjects or three or four or five, in rare cases, subjects to study to a, what's called advanced level. And uh, I chose maths, English literature and history. And it was, you know, it's a relatively unusual combination because usually you go to arts or sciences. Um, but I had to have a couple of arguments with, with teachers about timetables to make that happen. Um, but I was pretty insistent on that. And I enjoyed all three. And actually, I was probably strongest at English literature. Um, but the idea of doing three years of English literature didn't particularly uh, excite me. Um, or rather it felt like it was too much to one side. Uh, the idea of doing three years of maths wasn't particularly, uh, interesting to me either for the, for similar reasons. Um, and history seemed like a nice middle ground where it was artsy. Um, but at the same time there was an element of kind of, uh, uh, strictness, I guess, or, or, um, I don't want to say intellectual rigor, but, but you know, in history, you have to answer the question that's given. So you have to kind of be very precise, be very pre- precise about your response. Whereas English literature is much more, uh, quote unquote, it's creative. You have to, you, you have to present something that is a, a sophisticated uh, response to, to whatever question you're presented. So um, it was kind of a middle ground. I mean, also, my father was really interested in history. So uh, I guess that kind of carried through. Um but it, the, the other side of, of studying at Oxford that's kind of, I found really uh, positive was that while you specialize in one subject and you do one subject, you're hanging around with people of all different disciplines. So there's a, there's a college system where you have like two to 300 people in one building studying at the same time um, relatively independently. And so I was hanging out with mathematicians, uh, engineers, English literature students, philosophy students, and we'd all go drinking together. And I'd say that was my real education. You know, that's where I learned what I was interested in. And so I'd study, I'd talk about Wittgenstein with, with a lot with a, a friend of mine who was studying him in great detail. Um, I talk about literature a lot with my, uh, literature colleagues. Um, Matt, even maths, it was quite, you know, really interested in some of the, the things going on there. And so, you know, the, the history was the day job. I had to turn in my essays and, and present my material to the to the fellows. But um, the real value I got, you know, intellectually from that time was was two things. One was that that cross discipline thing. You know, there's no real you you really learn that there's, there's no actual distinction between all these things. They're just study. You know, you you specialize in something because you have to, because no one can be brilliant at everything, but actually they're all related disciplines and they all combine aspects of one another. Um, the other thing I really got from, from that, that place was, um, I was pushed, you know, everyone there is pushed to be really independent. You get very little support. So that's can be very uh, difficult emotionally to deal with, especially if you haven't been raised in that kind of system. Um, but at the same time, it, it gives you a great level of confidence when you go out to the world. And so, if I can just interrupt there, um, yes. uh, which 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 college were you at? Uh, I was at a college called Mansfield College. Okay, okay. Just again for anyone listening who's unfamiliar with uh, the, what Ian described very well, the the uh, benefits of the college system there. Uh, it makes a big difference to your experience at universities like that. Which college you go to? Um, and yes, one of the I mean, at least in my experience, also one of the most extraordinary things about the system 
is that you're mostly socially around people who aren't in your field. Um, mm. Your college will only have a few, your, your college, unless you choose to reject that life, uh, is the center of your social interaction. Um, mm -hmm. And there are only a limited number of other people in your same subject there. Mm -hmm. um, and there will actually be professors attached to your college in your subject, probably. Um, and so you can have a close interaction with them. But I wanted to talk to you about this, um, what you were invoking, I think, so well there, the the independence. Um, the, the analogy I had for doing uh, my, my doctorate there was that it was like you showed up and you're like, uh, they, they, you're a kite and they tie you to a rock and they get you up in the air and they come back in three years and they say, you know, what, what, how'd it go? Mm. Um, and some people thrive and some people don't for, for a time there, I had a bit of a, um, kind of, uh, junior Dean type role. Um, and mm -hmm. Oxford has, I think the highest rate of suicide mm. for students in the UK. Uh, did you, did you find yourself, did you find it stressful or did you find it invigorating that, that independence? Um, oh, well, definitely both. I mean, okay. I found it, um, I, I mean, I think one of the selection criteria that they use is not your grades so much as your drive and your willingness to, uh, go do yourself because that's the biggest determinant of whether someone will will survive there. Um, so I, I now remember that in my interview they were asking me about all sorts of stuff unrelated to my studies. Like, you know, um, they saw that I'd done some work experience as a journalist, so they were really interested in finding out what I got from that. They were, I mentioned, you know, we were discussing that I used to go to art galleries a lot. I was very interested in art history and, and art, art itself. And so they were they were very keen to learn about that. And and I think what they were looking for was, you know, is this person going to go out on their own on a Monday, cold Monday morning, and get out of bed, go to a library and sit for two hours reading about something they're perhaps not so interested in, in order to turn in an essay on on something they're not particularly interested in, because their drive their dr drive is is to go and do that. And um, I guess that's one of the things that. Um, that, that, that got me in. Um, the stresses are immense in a place like that because uh, there's a lot of talk in IT about imposter syndrome um, in IT, but it, I think it's pretty universal um, in, in most fields. I just think people in IT are not very good at accepting that they have, a, have, have imposter syndrome and that's okay. Um, yeah, and, and, and university, uh, an elite university, I think is full of people who think they don't deserve to be there, and I'm certainly one of those. So I felt, I remember feeling physically sick before every tutorial I ever had, you know, actually wanting to throw up, because I felt like any time now someone's going to turn around and say, you know, you realize you shouldn't be here, you know, you realize it was a big mistake, and uh, we found you out now, you know, that was, that was a constant feeling. Yeah, it's interesting when you when you talk about tutorials, um, the way it works, I think that a lot of our North American listeners that have mentioned this a couple of times already, but the system really is very different. So the way it works um, where Ian was studying is that you uh, have a tutor in a for a subject and you meet with them. I think it's conventionally once a week during term. Yeah, for me, it was once a week, sometimes sometimes one and a half or two. And that's, that's a tutorial is when you meet with the professor um, and you, you might have one or two or other students there. You might even be just alone with them. And, you know, this could be a world renowned professor that you've got this alone time with, and it can be very um, intimidating. It's deeply intimidating. I mean, it's, it's worse than that. They're not just chatting to you about what you've read that week. You have to sometimes read your work out to them while they sit and write notes or even submit them the night before and they will then give you uh, their view of, of what you've said uh, or perhaps uh, push you in certain ways and ask you questions. Um, I remember one tutor I had, I did, I did a medieval history course which I was really not interested in and it was just me and him 
and he was deeply old school. I mean, he was really, uh, my, my, my tutor at my own college described him as beat him up and shake hands afterwards. Tutor. Those medieval history guys, man. <laughs> You're not smiling when you say that you are, you are very serious. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they I mean, he, uh, cause you know, in, in certain ways I went to a school, which was not, a, a, I went to a high school, which was not very academic. It was a nice school, but it wasn't, you know, I was the first person ever to get to Oxbridge from there. And they, he, he actually said to me at one point in the tutorial, um, think about where Reims is relative to Paris, right? We were talking about France. And I looked, gave him this blank look and he looked at me and said, did you not study geography at school? So it was pretty much him saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, get get out. You know, you're not you're not qualified to be here, and you know maybe I wasn't, but it was it was a very and ironically I got my best mark in that subject because of course um, he was actually a very good teacher, um, and he wasn't going to let me get away with stuff, and he was going to push me and and you know if necessary embarrass me into working hard. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of a lesson there, but I do remember one week I was like completely lost trying to read up on, on some obscure sub subject I had to write on and I actually went to him, which is very unusual. I went to him midweek and asked to meet him and just to say like, I'm just completely lost. I've spent two days in the library and I have no idea what's going on. And he looked very disappointed. And I remember him putting his gloves on very carefully and saying, walk with me. And rather than saying, like, you know, just relax, calm down, it's not the end of the world, just keep at it, you know, maybe look at this text over this text and think about this and that. He just gave me a mini lecture of 10 minutes while he walked to his next appointment. And and then, you know, he was at his destination. He said, I must go now. And that was that. And I felt no, no better off. It was a very strange experience. Um, so, yeah, it, it could be really, really intimidating. And it could be, I mean, that those, those eight weeks were hell. Those eight weeks were really unpleasant. Um, yeah, it speaks to the um, independence that you invoked, um, that one <laughs> needs to thrive in that experience. I think from from people I've talked to, I think things have changed in the last 10 years or so, um, mm. a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, you uh, that those, <laughs> those years are hard. <laughs> But bear in mind, you know, not only are you doing that, and not, not only are you alone all the time, you're a hormonal 19, 20-year-old person who's, you know, experiencing all kinds of other stuff at the same time in these eight-week eight, eight week periods where you're supposed to cram in all this knowledge. And then you go home and, like, there's nothing to do or, you you you, you know, you're trying to find a job to, to, to go on holiday or whatever. Um, it's a... Uh, it's a it's very it's a very odd life and it's no surprise that a lot of people struggle with it and now i guess it's even worse cuz cuz you know they got 9000 pounds uh tuition fees to worry about and probably having to work more jobs than i did um you know i don't envy these these kids at all yeah the um the change that ian is referring to there is that um tuition has uh, gone up dramatically for university students in the UK in the last few years. Um, it, it actually was probably free when you were there, if I'm not mistaken or, or close. Tuition, to yeah, tuition was, was free until about 10 years ago. Um, when I was there, they just started about 10 years before I, I went, they removed kind of grants. So if you went to school, you went to um, university, uh, you fairly normally get a, get a grant of some kind from from the state to 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 help you survive um so we thought we had it tough but i think it's it's changed and of course anyone listening in america is going to be saying how easy it was for me which um with 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 great fairness um but you know it's something we we have to get used to in the uk yeah 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 and that's that's an, an unfortunate development um uh i remember being very surprised when I moved to London in 99, I was working on the Aldwych, which is uh, mm -hmm. near the Strand, right nestled amongst the London School of Economics buildings. And there were 
these constant, as I recall, student marches uh, with people protesting against having to pay tuition, which I had, I guess, I guess a kind of backwards chauvinism about. I thought, you know, well, you know, get your act together and pay a little bit of tuition for your education. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very big deal. My views on that would be much more considered now, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, add, as you're pointing out, you know, adding the stress of money, um, to an already stressful time in many different ways doesn't make things easier on Mm. young, on young people. And, uh, you know, especially as you say, you're, you're getting started in life in a lot of different ways, not just educationally at that time. Um, mm. there are a lot of factors to keep in mind. Um, you, uh, you, after a couple of years of, of moving about, you ended up formally studying computer science mm-hmm. at the university of London. Um, and I wanted to ask you whether or not you would recommend that same course of action to people who are thinking about getting into IT now. So, well, not necessarily recommendation. If if you were yourself, if you could give yourself some advice and you were 18 or 19 now and wanted to get into IT, would you recommend a formal course of study in computer uh, science? I do. <laughs> I do recommend it. Um, I've, I've, uh, in my previous job, I interviewed hundreds of, of graduates, and there's one graduate I remember very specifically. He was a physicist. He'd done a PhD in um, quantum physics, so we were all very impressed with him. And he was a very nice, smart guy, very diligent, clearly uh, someone you'd want working for you. And um, unfortunately, he had almost literally no experience in computing. I mean, he had he'd done some... Uh, programming as part of his physics course but it was very superficial um it wasn't you know it wasn't what what we needed and we drilled we grilled him for like two hours trying to find reasons to hire him and in the end we couldn't and i said like look you know i think you're great and i'd really like to hire you but i just can't justify it internally um and i i'm not sure it would be fair on you to put all this pressure on you to, to deliver at such a quick pace um what you should do is is do what I did. Borrow borrow the money, go and study computing in a conversion course. This there's a really good course at this university, which is the one I studied at. But I'm sure there's lots of other courses, but I recommend this one. Just take a year, borrow the money, get odd jobs here and there, and you'll have a really good grounding. Um, and uh, over the years, I've been really grateful for that for that grounding you know it was actually only seven months of an actual course um but actually during that course you know th- th- there were there were things that i learned in my first degree that really set me up for that so for example we had a bunch of lectures on computer architecture and at the first lecture the the we were given a sheet with basically the whole course in it it's all handwritten and there were exercises at the end of the thing so i took that sheet and I went home and I studied it from beginning to end and I figured like week four I was struggling with so I'll go to that lecture week six uh, was easy no problem there week five I might need to you know see how I feel at the time and I did that and then my fellow students were like what the hell are you doing you weren't at the lecture today and I said well uh, I've covered the material it's fine and they said you can't do that I said why can't I do that (laughs) it's my course it's my money you know I I think I've studied it. I'm ready for the exam. What's the big deal? You've got to go to the course. And it's like, no, I'm independent. This is, this is, you know, it's, uh, it's not about turning up and answering the register. It's about using my time effectively. Um, and that was a real, you know, that was, that showed me how much I'd got from those three years of, of studying alone. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. You draw that, that, um, you're drawing together two things that I think some people might consider to be incompatible there, one of which is formal study and the other one of which is independence. Um, mm. And I think a lot of people um, relate to formal study as a basically an experience of being institutionalized mm. and um, just doing what you're told. Mm. Uh, and um, that's because that's the experience they had, Yeah, um, to put it bluntly. Um, mm. And... Uh, for other people, you know, uh, having the opportunity to be attached to a big institution is just the uh, experience of having incredible resources available for you. 
mm. um, to use uh, and to learn from to achieve your own ends, um, which sounds kind of stark and harsh, but you know that's that's what a lot of people are also up to uh, when they're at it, when they're a part of a big institution. Um, yeah. And so then, so you have an interesting story. So you uh, went and worked for a company called OpenBet. Um, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. which grew, I say interesting, I mean, of course, it's interesting in lots of ways, but that the, the, you ended up experiencing um, uh, very strong growth there over the years. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about just what, what OpenBet does. Yeah, so uh, OpenBet is a company that uh, provides the backend systems for... Uh, I, I don't know the state of it now, but certainly when I left three, four years ago, um, for pretty much all the major uh, sports betting companies in the world, um, with a very couple of couple of exceptions, um, and essentially that is pretty close to high frequency trading challenges. So you might have a sports event with you know hundreds of thousands of people wanting to bet on it and they're all coming to the system at the same time. You want to take those bets really fast. You want to return their money really fast. You want to make sure everything happens uh, without, with as few problems as possible. You don't want the site to crash. You know, everything has to be uh, optimized. Um, performance was actually the, 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 the whole uh, selling point of the company. It's, its ability to, to perform. And so, you know, every time we were down for any reason, it was a big, big, big deal. Not only for the money lost, but the reputation, the fear that our company's reputation would go down. Um, there was a lot of scrutiny, a lot of, it was a very, very small world, a lot of people talking to one another. So um, we were under a lot of pressure. Um, it was a very uh, a robust environment to work in. Uh, actually, not dissimilar to um, Oxford in that sense, that there was a lot of imposter syndrome there too, a lot of people who had to run to keep up with each other, um, the odd crazy genius. Um, it was, it was a, uh, again, didn't realize it at the time, but it was an actual, you know, it was a real crucible of, of um, a lot of interesting things happening at once. And I learned an enormous amount in a very short space of time. I reflected that, you know, when I was there, I think I was like, uh, I guess about a year into the job and I was working on a Saturday with a colleague and I said, you know, I was, I was on the live, a live database with, you know, millions of pounds going through the system and I had complete uh, administrator rights and, you know, I could have done all sorts of crazy things. And I remember saying, you know, two years ago, I didn't know how to program. And now I've got this kind of access and this uh, this responsibility. It's really, really, or, or literally awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we just kind of both whistled and then got on get it, got on with the job. Um, but it, yeah, I I I was very very lucky to join there. Um, and yeah, so when I joined, we were thirty eight people in a room. Um, and. Over 14 years, we grew to 700 um, across the world. Um, so, uh, not not quite, you know, the kind of uh, Facebook story of, of zero to however many thousand employees, but um, certainly uh, we. It was a great learning curve in terms of every time we doubled in size, the problems changed. I was going to ask, what's your what's your what was your experience like of losing that kind of small team, everybody knows each other, corporate culture to one of, you know, fast growth and, and just kind of enterprise level issues? Did you, did you experience that as, as a loss or as an exciting change or, or some comment? Uh, there were many days I missed the, the small, you know, 38 people in a room. Um, you know, like when I joined... So, so again, it was double-edged, right? Because when I joined 38 in a room, the guy behind me was the CTO, a very awe-inspiring person called Chris Hall. Um, and to my left was some crazy guy called Fergus Gallagher, 
who was quite a frightening individual. And there were just people around me who were just all very intimidating. And we would like cheek by jowl. I mean, my desk was was very not much bigger than the, the keyboard. Um, everyone could see what what everyone was doing. If you wanted to know how something worked, you just shouted out to the room. Anyone know how payments work? How do payment systems work? And someone would say, "Oh yeah, Matt over there. He knows how it works. Go talk to him." Um, and that's that's what you did. You just you just you know you had these problems to solve, and and there was no structure. There were no timesheets. There was no uh, you know, if I wanted to spend two days documenting the shared code, you know, my project manager would just let me do it, trusted me, because he figured that I wasn't going to waste my time. So very different world to what we became, which was 700 people, and we, I instituted a load of processes and, and um, had to formalize a lot of things which were previously informal. Um, so, yeah, that was that – was, uh, there was definitely something lost, but at the same time, it was a new thing to learn. So you know, people say, oh, you worked at the same company for 14 years. I said, well, no, it's like three or four companies that I worked for. One was the 38 in a room. The other one was the 700 trying to figure out how to uh, industrialize a lot of these processes. In the middle, you had uh, these transition phases, which were also interesting. Um, it was, it was, I was learning a lot. Yeah, you mentioned. I think you mentioned documentation, um, and you have an interesting blog post where I think you talk about uh, taking months um, mm. to to formalize processes, uh, which is uh, from the from the from a sort of technical and big company perspective a really fascinating challenge mm. in a number of dimensions, including uh, convincing people uh, mm. that this is something that you should be doing. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that experience. Was it was it seven months that you spent on that project? Yes, I, I, like everyone else in IT, I complain about documentation. It's, it's kind of a sport. Everyone likes to complain they don't have enough documentation. It's like, like complaining you don't have enough resources to do your job. Um, and I, me and my boss, we worked, uh, Justin Hayes, we worked for about eight years side by side. And he was great because he, he, we trust, we, we'd grown up in the company together. So we completely trusted each other's judgments and and kind of you know we had a lot of respect for each other so when i said i want to take time out and just document the hell out of everything he could totally back me up and just said yeah i'll i'll, I'll make it happen let's, let's do it and it was seven months i spent documenting every major issue for the previous two years and the ones happening while i was doing it um and it took about four months before that that started to pay dividends um, so it was a long time of me sitting there in mostly at home, uh, also at work, uh, just, you know, collating, ranking, categorizing information and organizing it and structuring it in such a way that it would actually be usable by the team. Um, and the way I persuaded them that it was good, cause I was doing the job as well. You know, I was also, uh, supporting this was in a support third line support team so um i was actually doing you know investigations as well though le less so than before um and i would i would i would know that issues coming i'd say well you know i've written a document on that just follow these steps and and come back if there's a problem and gradually people the habits changed and people started to to like it but we had to in, me and my boss we had to enforce it we had to put someone on the job of of maintaining this stuff um it was a. It was wasn't just a matter of writing it. It was about actually putting the procedures in place to maintain the the asset that we built. Um, and funnily enough, at Barclays, I'm where I am now. Um, I'm going through a similar kind of experience. That that it's not just enough to to put the material together. You have to be in the team with the team, uh, coaching them through uh, the, the 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 difficult mentality of investment of not just fixing the problem right in front of you but actually thinking about what 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 investment are you putting so the next time you spend less time on this and next time you'll have a bit more time to do the more interesting work um it's very very difficult to get that across um and i don't you know i don't have the answer any more than anyone else does but it, it, it it's not quick whatever it is 
Yeah, I've got a, I've got a couple of, of questions about um, things related to that that I'm going to ask you about, about Docker and your experience uh, bringing that into organizations. Um, but I've got a couple of questions uh, about your move away from OpenBet. Mm -hmm. um, so you, the, the first one is, um, so you moved to this, this really giant organization. Mm -hmm. um, what was, what was that like? Was that, did that, did that feel like a, uh, an increase in autonomy and power or did it feel like a decrease or is it, are they just not comparable experiences? Uh, it, on one level, it was a, it was a real decrease in power because I went from a, a position where I, I knew everything, uh, not everything literally, but I knew so much about the organization I worked for. I knew its DNA. I knew who the founders were. I knew all the arguments that they've been had over the years. I, I, I knew the metabolism of the organization. I could, I could tell you, you know, an initiative would be started and I could tell you how that would pan out over the next two years. You know, I knew, I knew the whole culture. So going from that to an environment where I'd never worked in banking, I'd never worked in a regulated environment. I'd never worked in infrastructure. So it was an infrastructure team I joined above. It's not a development team. Um, I'd never worked for a big corporation like this. Um, you know, there were so many firsts for me um, that it was really frightening. And for a long, long time, I, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't quite know how to operate in that, in that world. Um, I had a lot to learn. Um, so in that sense, it felt very, uh, I felt very impotent. Um, in another sense, it was quite empowering because I'd gone from this company that was not very well known, that was behind a lot of big names, but wasn't really a big name in itself, to a company that you know, whose name opened doors. So you say you work for a big bank and suddenly people want to talk to you. Suddenly people want to um, help you out or discuss things with you or invite you to conferences or, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that, that happen as a result of that. Um, you know, I, I very early on in my time there, I was invited to talk to some very senior people at a very big, well-known techni te technology firm. Just no, no obligation, just spend a few hours chatting about your experiences with them. And uh, it was, I just kept having to pinch myself because, you know, a few weeks before I was just being shouted at by people for, for, for not delivering something that was impossible to deliver. And it was, it was a completely different experience. Um, and actually, so, yeah. You mentioned regulation and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, um, uh, gambling is regulated, um, but but banking is is also very regulated. And I was wondering, in, in your in your job in infrastructure, how does how does regulation touch on what you do? It is what I do. I mean, regulate the the regulatory regime under which we work informs everything we do. Um, it's the constraint that drives all the behaviors of an enterprise organization. So I work in a team that's involved in cloud transformation. So we're looking at um, ways that we can move our workloads into cloud. And, you know, we, we, we interact with a lot of people who have the perception that it's a matter of you, where you, you flick the, uh, the cloud switch and then you, all the services that I have at home are available to me at work. You know, that, that, sh that should be how it works because it doesn't work anything like that because – um, each organization has its own disposition towards the rules under which it works. Now, in the case of a large bank, um, you have several choices. You can either say each individual team has its own constraints and decides what its, uh, what its regulatory uh, situation is. And by, by team, I can mean business unit of thousands or whatever. The route that some larger organizations take is to take a whatever we build is going to be fit for any regulatory regime, which means you then have to define your own standards to match all these regulatory regimes. And that means that you have your own rule setters within the organization. 
And those rule setters within the organization determine what you can and can't do. And so you end up in a situation where you have to kind of figure out how you can build software in this in this environment. So I'll give you an example to make it slightly more vivid. Um, when I was at OpenBet, I had root on my laptop. I had pretty much full access to the network. So in the early days of experimenting with Docker, we set up some sort of, I can't remember exactly the details, but we set up some sort of DNS server by accident on the network with a, with a spare PC we'd found and hooked up to the network. And we ended up uh, drawing a lot of network traffic into our box and causing all sorts of issues for the network admin. Now, you know, if I did something like that at Barclays, I'd be fired. You know, no question. Um, because uh, the, because the, the regulatory regime under which I worked at, at OpenBit was so different, it was about enabling people to deliver fast. Um, I got a slap on the wrists. You know, I got told off and the, the IT manager said, you know, Please don't do that again. So completely different, uh, completely different world. Um, and because I had root on my laptop, I had no external dependencies. You know, I if I wanted to get a piece of software installed, I'd download the pieces and, and compile it, and there it was. It was you know, as root, I could use it. Um, whereas trying to do that within a corporate environment. Um, at a large bank is completely different. You know. uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about uh, working in those kinds of environments. Um, I'll put some links in the in the notes to this or the transcription to this um, interview, so people can see your really good talks you've given on YouTube. So you can go into you've already you know gone into detail on this in in uh, recorded ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but one thing one thing you talk about is, and this is related to what you were just saying, I think. Um, is let me just find this quotation here uh, from a talk you gave. Um, and this isn't this is you quoting someone else, but you say people who are really serious about software should get serious about people. Um, mm. And in particular, what you're getting at there is the internal politics of doing something like bringing bringing a new approach to things like say Docker when you haven't had Docker, uh, mm. and you know things like you know the problems that the, the concerns people might have about giving root access to individual users and things like that. Mm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, that process. If, if let's say someone someone is listening to this and they're like, okay, well, I would, I'm serious about software and I want to get serious about people. What does that actually mean um, if you're in a, a big company? You, I mean, you talk about things like, um, uh, you know, finding out who makes the decisions. Yeah, I mean... Again, I can give a very specific example of something I did in this area. So um, I, when I went to OpenBet, I remember I had a kind of New, Year, New Year's resolution, which was to stop using chat and physically move to, to speak to anyone I needed to speak to, if possible. So rather than like uh, chatting someone, you know, the site's down or um, – uh, I need to talk to you about an issue. I would physically go and talk to them. And, you know, often they'd be busy or whatever, but I would bump into so-and-so and, and they'd ask me about something and or they'd say, like, oh, your teammate is really bothering me about this thing and then what's going on. And, and after about two or three months of doing this, I noticed that my career was going to a new level because I suddenly had this web of knowledge that no one else had about how the whole organization worked. Um and I studied, you know, I mentioned I studied history. I studied Russian revolutionary history uh, quite a lot from the age of 16 to 20, 21. And one of the things that I found really vivid about that was uh, Joseph Stalin, his rise to power was very interesting because uh, the way I understood it was that he was considered a very average kind of party guy you know nothing special about him it was Lenin and Trotsky who were the real superstars and Stalin got this job as general secretary which is not a very sexy job it was just kind of he was known as comrade card index meaning that he just had all this information in card indexes about people and you know he was just a bureaucrat but what he actually had was contact with everyone in the party and it was actually thinking about that and his rise to power and how he did that, that I thought, well, perhaps there's something I can learn from that. 
I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to uh, ape Stalin in in many ways, but uh, you know it, it was an interesting analogy, and and so I did this thing of, of, of physically going out and talking to people, and I, I found that the dividends it paid were really really powerful, really powerful, and. The, the things I learned, you know, because you'd, you'd be talking about something and you'd see a book that someone had just bought and you'd be going, what's going on here? And and someone would mention something else that, that they wouldn't necessarily have emailed you about, but they actually it's on their mind. So they took, and all these things just add up very, really fast. I mean, when I say really fast, I mean, like it took about two months to really see it happen. But um, that was a real lesson in, in you know, it's not just about um, fixing bugs or, or or whatever it's also about um persuading people and yeah thanks thanks for that answer um <clears throat> it's um uh pretty rare i find that people uh can be so specific about what to do and so that's really great uh, mm. thanks for that often often you know advice comes in the form as, as you would know you know advice comes in the form of sort of general statements but you know mm. that 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 um that's a very striking example of just you know getting getting off your desk getting away from your screen and going around and talking to people as a way of figuring out how an organization works um is really really compelling um one thing i wanted to ask you about uh this is this is a bit of a sideways question um but it has come up on this podcast and i'm interviewing people from the uk um so you work at canary wharf um there's a lot of people in the finance world there um, and they're all confronting um, the realities of the Brexit referendum vote mm -hmm. um, and how that's turning out. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, just like, I just wanted to take the opportunity to ask you, what's the feeling like on the ground there? Uh, are people concerned? Um, well, yes. I mean, do you, when you say concerned, do you mean concerned for their jobs or do you mean concerned? Oh, right. Um I don't get a sense of people being particularly concerned for their jobs, um, but perhaps Barclays is quote unquote unusual in that it made a very early statement that it was staying in the UK. Um, however, you know, when you work for an organization of that size, uh, if you're not on the board, there's an extent to which you don't really know what's going on. So you don't necessarily worry about it too much. Um, if you did, you, you drive yourself crazy because you can't really know exactly what's going to happen. And there's also a general sense in the industry that, you know, the job isn't for life and we could all be, you know, an, uh, an accountant decides that we're too expensive and suddenly we're out of a job. And we all know that this can happen. It's just the nature of the game. So it's not something we discuss very much. Certainly Brexit is, is a subject that comes up a lot, but in terms of our jobs, it's not, um, it's not high among the list of threats that we, we see ourselves facing, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Yeah, no, that, that's a very uh, good and, and, and I think very uh, realistic way of, of, of stating the issue. Um, uh, yeah, the, um, one of the reasons I, I find it so interesting is, is, as I was mentioning to you before this, this interview, I used to work in uh, M&A in London and, um, you know, I worked on a team that was interested in um, M&A in Europe, uh, not just in the UK. And many of my colleagues were European and, um, uh, you know, the realities they would be facing under circumstances like this would be, um, you know, concerning in a way. But, you know, as you put it so well, there are so many other paths that you can go down, uh, yeah. you know, in with in jobs like that that you know it just becomes one of one of many many things um and you know relocation isn't isn't the end of the world um and can often often be exciting as well um yeah i mean i don't i don't think there's much uh talk of relocation i mean also i guess another factor is that in it the jobs is, are so plentiful at the moment that there isn't really this sense of existential you know, if the if the company decides I have to move to Frankfurt, I have to move to Frankfurt. There's n there's little sense of that, um, but there is always the risk that your team could be considered wanting and just suddenly cut. You know that that can happen. Um, 
but then I, I worried for 14 years about open bet, you know, going out of business or whatever, you know, I think after a certain amount of time in, in any industry, you, you, you stop be <laughs> getting too worried about these things. It's funny. We're, we're making everything sound very harsh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from university to, you know, what's, what's Brexit compared to the uncertainty I live with every day, just as a structural part of my job. <laughs> um, well, I mean, in a sense, we end up, you know, life is a series of choices, right? And I've chosen to push myself to university. I've chosen to push myself to jobs that are more challenging. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, and, you know, while it can be very difficult, it's also uh, not dull. And I, I've never wanted a, a dull job. So um, I think you have to learn to accept what you're about and find your limits. You know, there are things I put up with in my younger career that I would not put up with now. And ironically, I find that the older I get, the more I, I uh, set boundaries, uh, the more they're respected, which is kind of an interesting experience to, to go through. Um, so, yeah. One, one thing you write about on your blog um, uh, is uh, a change you made, speaking of, of getting older and how, how things can change and things you can do uh, to improve your professional life. Um, you write, you have a blog post called How I Manage My Time. Mm. Um, where you write about how uh, you you have this this very straightforward line. I was disorganized until my thirties, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you, and then you had an experience which I think I, which other people I've 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 met have had with with specifically with the book getting things done mm. uh, that helped you change things around. And I was wondering if you could if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, I was always very. Uh... <sighs> I was not very organized, as I said, until um, I hit my 30s. And um, I think a lot of things changed over time. It's not just like a, a road to Damascus kind of moment. But um, I can pinpoint a very specific experience I had where I just thought I can't go on like this. And I talked about it in the blog. And it's it's where someone had asked me to do something on the Friday to do it on the Monday. And I'd forgotten to do it. Just clean forgot. And... Um, she phoned up and I, she said, did you do the thing? And I said, no, I, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't, you know, and she wasn't particularly, uh, it wasn't that she was particularly angry with me. She was, she was angry, but she was just kind of, okay, now I'm going to go and sort this out. Goodbye. And I felt really disappointed in myself because I thought, I know I can do better than this. You know, this is just not, there's no excuse for this. Uh, I'm sure I can do better. And it was about a month later that I was on holiday. And I saw in the, I just, it, unconscious, I guess, but I was in a bookshop and I happened to see the book. Uh, and I think unconsciously my mind was drawn towards it. I picked it up and I was ready to make fun of it because, uh, you know, you there, were, there was like a trope on Hacker News of uh, every other post was someone saying, getting things done changed my life. And so I was ready to pick this thing up and laugh at it. And so I picked it up and I read like the first, few pages I flicked through the first few pages and all these sort of common sense things were coming out of the page at me and it was actual like you said it was actual things that I could do to make a difference and I thought well this all makes sense this guy seems to know what he's doing so I bought the book and I read it in a couple of days and I immediately implemented everything in the book um and uh the, the one thing about the book that I didn't wasn't clear to me before I read it was how pragmatic it was it's not, it's not prescriptive about how you do it. It just says these are the principles you need to think about. This is why you do it, and this is the benefit you'll get. And it said, you know, whatever way you, your mind works, just follow that. Whatever works for you. The principles are simple, and the principle, you know, the principles boil down to things like make sure that everything that goes in your mind, like pops up in your head, gets put into one place. So whether that's a journal or whether that's a, uh, I use Jira or it's a text file or it's, you know, it's your phone, a phone notepad or something, anything, as long as you trust that that place has all the things that are on your mind, then, um, then you, your mind can be free to actually creatively think about the problems you really have. 
that you have to work through. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it, uh, that implementing that and refining that process and so on has really changed my life because rather than seeing life as a series of, of inchoate challenges that I have to remember to, to get to, I can actually go to my Jira and see the list of things that, that, are, that are on my mind and just work through them one by one and, and figure out, well, actually, it's not realistic to get all that done anytime soon. So I'm going to have to ditch some of those. And so physically moving them from, from a Trello board or a Jira board or whatever helps you mentally free yourself of that concern. Yeah, it's interesting you, you brought up that trust and mentally freeing yourself. I've, I've only read bits and pieces of getting things done, but that was one of the things that struck me about it was that mm. um, improving productivity, it can, you, you, especially if, if you're nerdy, you know, you immediately mm. jump to the tools. Um, mm. But one of the things to keep in mind is your mood mm. uh, and how important that is uh, in in getting things done. Yeah, absolutely. And so... Um, in the morning, I'll tend to focus on tasks that are more cognitively difficult. So I'll front load those to the to the morning, and then later in the afternoon, I'll I'll do the more kind of routine admin stuff. And there's plenty of that to do at a bank. So you know, timesheets and 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 go, going through the email and responding to questions and things like that, which are more kind of routine and, and mechanical. Um, I tend to push those towards later in the day, um, and there's a great quote from the book which says um, it, the purpose of this book is to enable you not to be comfortable about what you're doing but about what you're not doing. And th there's a huge amount in that because I remember doing things and having half a mind on something else most of the time. And it's incredibly destructive because we're not great multitaskers, um, uh, human beings, that is, not, not just men. Um, so – that freedom to focus on the task at hand means that you get more done quicker. It also means that if something comes up you need to, to attend to right then, you have less other uh, um, stuff on your plate to, to for it to compete with. So it's a really, you know, I I, I, I have a, a list of five books I'd advise every DevOps engineer to read, and that's one of them because DevOps, if you're in ops, uh, ops is typically a very uh, uh, interrupt-driven kind of uh, work, and so your ability to manage your own mind is critical. You know, I was, I was getting, you know, I was, I was on call for years, and, and I remember the, the stress sometimes was just enormous, and, and I ended up, you know, behaving in certain ways simply because I was just under this huge stress. And I'm sure you, you mentioned you worked in M and A and so on. It was, probably a similar kind of uh, peak and trough to the work um, oh, at times. Yeah, I could tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I miss it, um, but it was uh, very intense. Um, and yeah. it's, it's interesting. I've, I've, inter what, one of the, I've interviewed some people on this uh, podcast who uh, worked in uh, fact f factories um, where they're managing the software that keeps things running. And they describe a similar kind of kind of stress, I think, to what you were just describing. I mean, you were talking about how, like, you know, with, with OpenBet, it was like high frequency trading, and you know, there's like there's there's a match happening now. Mm. There's betting happening now, and, yeah. and there's 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 that sort of imminence to what. Well, you've you're got doing. thousands of people whose jobs depend on you, your ability to take bets, mm -hmm. and the system's down, right? So we're losing money now. We just lost a thousand. We lost another thousand, another thousand, thousand, another thousand. You know, and <laughs> it's very hard to focus your mind on logic <laughs> while someone's, you know, very stressed. And in the early days, there was a lot of uh, un <laughs> unregulated, unmonitored, unmanaged shouting going on. Um, and over time, I think we as organisations. So our, our organizations and our clients had to learn how to manage these things. And it was, it was a real privilege, actually, in retrospect, to, to see how that learning process happens and how the, the structures build up and where a cab comes from. You know, a change, change advisory board um, 
we didn't have change advisory boards. We had people on the end of the phone who, was, who would shout at us when something was down until we showed them the right level of commitment to getting it sold. But then, you know, you fast forward five years and you've got a group of people who are, don't know anything about the system deciding whether something's too risky to go live or not. And, and that's a huge, huge leap. And to see how that happens step by step is really, really interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you've on on your blog. Uh, there's there's one post I found called um, "Things I Learned Managing Site Reliability" uh, mm. for some of the world's busiest gambling sites. And I think it's in that one. Although I might be confusing it with with another one where you talk about how process and checklists um, mm. are actually not there in the way people often conceive of them as things sort of to be lazy about but they're actually there for when things get really hard. Yeah. And when, when everything's really slamming against you, that's when you need, that's when you, so the sort of the hard ass thing is to actually get the process right. Uh, yeah. When you're, when you've got the freedom to do so rather than when, you know, the tsunamis coming in. Yeah. It's, um, there's a, I can't remember the book, uh, that I read that, that changed my, uh, that the really, provoked me to do all this work in, on checklists but um uh checklist manifesto that's the one that's the one so uh it's a great book written by a guy who is a he's a, he works in medicine um and he looks at uh, several industries so aviation uh medicine he looks at construction um i think those are the three big ones but obviously it has applications for, for it as well so you know, you think about it, aviation, you make mistakes, the plane crashes, right? People die. Medicine, you make a mistake, people die. Construction, you make a mistake, building falls down, people die. Um, you know, some people can't take some bets, not, not really such a big deal. So, so those guys, um, you know, and, and also they're not, they're not new industries. Aviation has been around for a hundred years. Uh, medicine obviously has been around for a long time. Uh, and construction has been around for a long time. So uh, those 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 three industries have all, in, in the different ways, used checklists to overcome particular challenges. Um, and the, the, the differences between them are really interesting, but I won't go into that now. Um, but, you know, we, uh, people in IT have this, I think uh, there is a, a general tendency to think that it's somehow different from from everything that's come before it because the technology is new. But it's still people driving the bus. So, and people are subject to the same problems that they are if they're at the operating table uh, wielding a scalpel. You know, you can you can you can send a, you can accidentally send a text to to Hawaii saying that everyone's needs to get to a shelter now, um, or you can you can make a mistake at an operating table or crash a plane. These things can all happen, and the. Uh, one of the ways to help you manage your uh, stress levels is by having these repeatable processes. Um, the one the example from the book that I really remember was the, do you remember the, the crash into the Hudson River? Yes. Um, the pilot of that, I mean, there's a film of it since then, Scully, which I haven't seen, but um, as I understand it, the captain had had 40, 30, 40 years of training of checklists. And the, the paradox is that people think that this will make you very uncreative. But actually, the, the freedom that the checklist gives you is it says, right, this is automatic, I can do this. And while he was doing going through the checklist, um, he, he actually came up with a creative solution to the problem, which was uh, dive into the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, and that's exactly the experience we had. We had priority incidents come in, and you'd kind of forget the steps to take, and you'd kind of go, "Oh, I know there was a ticket for this before, and we solved this problem before, but I can't remember the details. And what did we do? And oh, look, there's what we did before, but that was a red herring." And, da, 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 da. and to move from that to, you know, oh, we had the steps written up. So step one, do this. Step two, do that. It was really powerful. And then you could do things like you could give uh, one guy the checklist, the less experienced guy the checklist, and the more experienced guy, you'd let him be creative. You know, just just try and find the solution now. Immediately get there. And the other guy will go through the checklist 
and one of you is going to find the answer. Um, and it was much less stressful, much less noise, much more repeatable, reliable, and so on. It was a really, um, you know, it was a great work that we did there, but very hard to emulate elsewhere. Uh, I could talk about this for a long time, <laughs> um, but we should probably move on um, to the, the final part of uh, the interview where I talk to you about your work as an, as an author, Yeah. Um, speaking of books and productivity. Um, and so you uh, are the co-author of Docker for Devs, um, which you published with Manning. And I was, Docker in practice. Sorry, pardon, pardon me, Docker in practice. I get the, I get them mixed up sometimes. Um, uh, and can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like working working with well with a co-author, but also with a with a conventional publishing company to get a book out? Yeah, so uh, it was. I think they. I think I was recommended to them by a a, a friend uh, in the industry, and and uh, we had a chat. I had a chat with the editor and they helped us work up a presentation, not presentation, a precy of the material. Um, I didn't want to write it on my own because I felt it would be too much work for one person to do. So the, one of the people who helped me get Docker in my company, whose, whose skill set very much complemented mine, um, we, I persuaded him to, to join me in, in doing this. Um, so we worked together on it. Uh, we got a pricey going. They accepted it. We then went away and, and wrote it up um, because I'd had experience as a journalist and um, had to, written a lot of stuff in my history degree. Um, I found the process of writing quite easy. You know, uh, I didn't question my writing too much, and I'd, I'd, you know, I'd just done a lot of it. Um, so uh, that side of it, I, I was fine. It was a lot of work, um, not just producing the material, but working it through the system, you know, the review process, the re-review process, the proofreading. Pro it was all very uh, time-consuming and, and a lot of work. But it was a very good way, it was a very good training for what needs to be done to get a book out. So I think it was a very valuable experience in that way. And uh, you used that experience to write a book uh, that you published through LeanPub, Learn Bash the Hard Way, um, which I think is uh, partly inspired by some uh, pretty successful uh, blog posts you had. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And takes the form of a course. And um, at, the, at the end of the book, um, you give out your email address and you ask for feedback. And I wanted to ask you about that, that because that's one of the interesting aspects of publishing on LeanPub that authors often encounter is that they can, because it's easy to update your book at any time, feedback mm. can help you change your content. Has that, has that been the experience that you've had? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really powerful, because, because you're so disintermediated from the reader. You know, the reader knows, even when you buy the book, you see the, the author will get this much money, right? So there is a sense in which they are handing you money directly, and there's a contract between you and the, the reader. And the, the, the website doesn't really come between you in that in that way. There's no lean pub is not saying, "Well, you think this author is great and you should buy this book." It's actually me saying that, and and they they hand over the money to me. So I think I've noticed that people are far more willing to give me feedback directly um, than through with a written book, where I feel like that I think they think there is an institution of people who they have to get through to, to get to the author or it's somehow a little bit more intimidating to them. Whereas, whereas this, um, it's much more fluid and it's much more, um, actually productive for me. Uh, I, I've, I've been rewriting bits of the book today, uh, in response to some of the things people have said. Um, I've, uh, people have pointed out typos. People have, um, you know, said what they really liked about the book. Um, it's been really, really powerful. And, and also, you know, readers who buy it get the updates for free. So I've had, I've had to point that out to people. They're like, thanks for your feedback. And, you know, you'll get the next edition with some of these points taken on board. And they're really happy about that. And, um, yeah, I, I, I find it incredibly satisfying. You know, I wrote this. It was actually a course I wrote for um, – uh, for a, a company that never got delivered. 
Um, but I wrote it a year ago and, you know, I had this material and I, I thought, why not turn it into a book? And it's been incredibly gratifying because it's such an uh, ostensibly unsexy subject. You know, Bash is 30 years old or whatever, and and uh, people use it all the time and take it for granted. And yet the interest in it has been, you know, really surprising to me, really surprising and, and very gratifying. Um, you know, there's life in that technology yet. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to carry on writing it, expanding it. Um, I have another book, that another course I've already written on Git, which I'm going to turn into another book. Um so yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks thanks very much for that description actually that's um that's uh one of the things you were referring to there is that when you when someone buys a book on leanpub there are these pricing sliders and you choose what to pay um and you see what you're going to pay and you see what the author's going to earn um mm. and one of the interesting bits of leanpub lore you might be interesting to, interested to hear is that um shortly after we implemented that author earned slider we started getting people paying this odd price, which I, I always get it wrong, uh, but it's like it was like eleven twenty seven or something like that and uh this this was actually uh Limpa pays a royalty rate of ninety percent minus fifty cents per transaction to authors, and this mm -hmm. price was actually what would happen if you dragged the author earn slider to ten dollars um, <laughs> so people were relating to it kind of like how you were describing as how much they were giving the author rather mm -hmm. than rather than how much they were paying uh was really mm -hmm. what was uh, preoccupying them and um, and it that it in addition to the showing what the author is going to earn but just giving people the choice mm. of what to pay I've always had a kind of you know I've always related to that as something that really changes the relationship that people feel they have with the author um, mm. just that just, just whether they choose to pay a different price than they're presented with or not the fact that they've got a choice I think uh, makes them feel like there's already there, there's a relationship there that isn't just receptive, um, but is also sort yeah. of transmitting. Um, what the last question I always uh, selfishly ask in these podcasts is: um, if there was one feature we could build for you, or one problem we could fix, uh, what would you ask us to do? Uh, it's it's interesting that. You talked about this because I was thinking about this very thing today. Um, and I don't know if it fits with the business model, but and I don't I, I wouldn't probably use it myself. But I was thinking if I was an author who never published a book before, and maybe was less confident. I think there are other value adds that LeanPub could bring to, to the author. So and it could be. Uh, they could all be optional, right? So you could, you could. I mean, I'm just brainstorming here, but you could have like a, a proofreading service, to take a simple example, or a review service, um, or uh, even a kind of seal of approval, like we've checked over this book, we think it's a good standard, you know, that that kind of thing. Um, that might might cause commercial problems, but but actually, you know. The, Maybe even just uh, uh, we'll we'll review your idea and s tell you if we think it's a, a flyer or not. Um, I think maybe there's something in that space that could be offered. However, I'm also kind of worried that that will dilute the purity of the, the Lean Pub uh, concept because the, one of the great things about Lean Pub is you kind of get out of the way. <laughs> um, you, you, I feel like you take a very fair cut of for providing a service that enables me to get my content to readers without too much fuss. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those suggestions. That's really interesting. Um, you know, without going into into the weeds in the in the sort of self publishing world, um, well, a there there are uh, companies that are devoted entirely to connecting authors to people who provide services like that. Mm. Um, but one of the one of the issues, and this is less a less a concern than it was in the past, but it's still there, is that in the self publishing world, people are often concerned about the platform merely being a kind of like hook to get you into paying for services. Mm. Um, and so it's that that's just kind of like an inherent. It's not a, it's not necessarily a problem. It's just a part of the environment that you operate in. So if someone comes to your site, and it's like 
by the way, pay a bunch of editors, you know, mm. it doesn't necessarily, and, 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 and yeah. yeah, and, and it's just, it's just a matter of diplomacy. Um, but also, um, you know, kind of deep lean pub is you should just stop being so worried, uh, mm. and start writing and publishing. And you know what people will, they will give you feedback and they will want to help you improve your book. Um, so this, this is one of the problems I had though, because I remember sitting there at the screen where you pay X amount of dollars to, to publish mm-hmm. and sort of umming and ahhing about, you know, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? I had no idea how quickly I'd get my money back. No idea. And I think there's probably a lot of people who sit on that screen and think, is this a good idea? Should I, should I do this? Cause it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it's enough to make you think, Hmm, is this just that's, a waste of my time? That's really interesting. Thanks very much for that feedback. Um, uh, yeah, the, the one, that's something for, that we think about very hard and we've got some changes coming there, uh, that I can't, I can't talk about in advance of them being done. Um, but thanks very much for that. That's, um, that's really interesting and specific. Uh, and that's something that I'm going to take back to the team, uh, because you've, you've got me going down a train of thought now. Um, that's kind of interesting. So thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, one, one, one thing we do have is, uh, that people might not know is that when you do, when you create a lean pub book, even before you start writing, um, you have a web page where people can, um, give their email address to be informed about when the book is published. Um, and they can also actually say what price they'd be willing to pay. Mm. But you do, but you do have to create the book before you can start getting that feedback. And so perhaps giving people more information about the kind of ad- research they'll be able to do even before they maybe actually publish a version first mm. uh, might, might help them uh, get over that, that uncertainty. Today on Twitter, I was asking my uh, followers, uh, what should I write on next? You know, so a similar, yeah, similar thing would be, would be really good if it was native to Neat Lean Pub. I mean, I, 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 it's very hard to know if you're not in the world, it's very hard to know. And I had the same experience blogging. I spent three years blogging with literally no one reading it and then suddenly it blew up. Um, it's very hard to know how these things work. Like if I put this on there, a hundred people going to come at me expecting this book to be published tomorrow. Or is it going to be like, I'm going to get some really constructive. You just don't know. You just don't know. And, um, I think there's, there's some scope for a guide, some mentoring perhaps. I mean, maybe there's a barrier to entry there. So if you've published a book with someone else, then perhaps you get fast tracked. It's a very selfish thing to think, but 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 you, I guess there's a limited amount of time that Lean Pub can spend on these people, and so you, know, you might want to sift through in, in some way. Um, yeah. But I, I I get what you're saying about not wanting to become this kind of uh, pay us ten dollars and we'll look at your manuscript um, because you know I, I wrote a uh, we didn't cover this, but I wrote a novel after I left university and and I just I literally didn't know what to do with it. I had no idea what to do with it and it ended up withering on the vine. And, um, you know, uh, I wanted a mentor. I, li- I remember literally writing to agents and saying, you know, if you think I have any talent, please don't worry about this book. Just tell me what you think I should do. Where should I go next? Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really great feedback. Thanks for that. It really, um, it, it, it can be for us, it can be really easy to sort of like, see things from the side where you've already started and you've already written a lot and stuff like that. But to, to think about it from that, that moment when you're deciding what to do, or you've already got something and you're sort of nervous or not necessarily, you're, you're just uncertain, you know, you're uncertain about what, what's really happening here and how it's going to go. That's really good for focusing, um, us. So thanks. Thanks very much. And also the price point, I had no idea where to pitch it. So, um, you know, I, I pitched it somewhere and, and it's worked out well for me, but I don't know how it would have been. I had no, I had no, nowhere to go for advice. So I'd looked at a couple of blogs and kind of, you know, put my finger in the air. Um, but I, I should generally, if, uh, by the way, if you know anyone who can advise me on that, that'd be really, really useful to me, especially with my next book. So, okay. uh, yeah, 
that's another area where I, I really kind of wondered what the hell I was doing and how I should proceed. Well, thanks. Thanks very much for that. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, thanks. Thanks for being a lean pub author, uh, Ian. And thank you very much for taking the time for this conversation. Um, uh, we covered a lot of ground and I really, I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.